Okay, so today we're going to be going over um, uh, water quality. So we're going to take a look at some um, sources of pollution and then also some tactics that we might use to clean up that pollution. So first of all, pollution is contamination of a substance with an undesirable material. So water pollution would be something undesirable in water, air pollution is something undesirable in air, but we just have this undesirable substance and uh, we want to be able to take care of that pollution. And when we're talking about pollution, you'll see a number of terms that are used. Uh, PPM is parts per million, PPB is parts per billion. And this is very much like a percentage, which is a part per hundred. Um, TDS is total dissolved solids. And then pH is the measure of the acidity or alkalinity of your water. Acidic water corrodes pipes, alkaline water leaves scale. You know, that white stuff that gets stuck in your coffee maker, on your shower head, or things like that. That's scale. Um, if you use or if you have a municipal water supply, so if you get your water from the city, at least once a year they're supposed to send you a water quality report. Uh, usually it's stuffed in one of your bills. And uh, you will see some of these things listed on that water quality report. Now I want to uh, bring your attention to this one, this total dissolved solids. That's everything that's dissolved in the water. And while that's an important thing to measure, you do also want to know what those dissolved solids are. Um, because if it's like, um, I don't know, calcium, you probably don't care so much. If it's arsenic, you probably care a lot. And so not only do you want to know how high the TDS is, you also know, want to know what the things in there are. What are those solids? Now when we talk about pollution, um, we want to look at the source of our pollution. You can either have a point source or a non-point source. In a point source, the pollution is released at an easily identified spot. So this would be maybe a chemical spill at, um, at some kind of uh, chemical or plant or refinery, or maybe it's a railway tanker that tips over, or it's something where it can be like right there, that's where the pollution's coming from. Now, the non-point source is different. It's diffuse, it's widespread, and can oftentimes be a little more difficult to deal with because we can't just go to a single location and stop that pollution from entering the system. A good example of a non-point source is basically farm fields. Farm fields are, um, uh, they, farmers use a lot of fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides and some of that ends up uh, washing off the fields and into the water uh, systems. And um, you can't really say it's this one particular field or this one little acre that's causing it. It's that whole farming area. So that would be a non-point source. And that's just what we're looking at here. Point source traced to a specific place and our non-point sources are diffuse and the problem is once you get these things into both the surface water and underground, well, now we have to worry about um, trying to get that cleaned up. Now, another thing you want to worry about when you're looking at pollution is residence time. Residence time is the average length of time a substance stays in a, in a system. So this is like the average length of time whatever contamination we're looking at is going to be in our uh, lake or our groundwater or our river or whatever. And that's important when we look at cleaning things up because if we have some kind of contaminant that um, has a short residence time, it's only going to be there for a short period of time, you know, like, oh, it's going to be there a week. We probably don't want to be, you know, investing 
hundreds of millions of dollars trying to clean this thing up. We probably will be like, let the, let the natural system take care of it. We'll just not use that for a week. But if it's going to be something that's going to be around for thousands of years, well, we might then want to invest in uh, cleaning that up. So we want to know this residence time so we can figure out kind of a cost benefit analysis of just how much time and energy do we want to invest in cleaning up um, and dealing with the issue. All right, so let's look at some types of um, groundwater pollution or uh, contamination. Um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about hard water. So what is hard water? Well, please don't answer this on your test. Please don't say ice. Um, it's sort of technically right, but it's not really right. So what is hard water? Seriously, what it is, it's where you have high concentrations of calcium and magnesium in the water. And you can see what we consider high concentrations. Soft water is anywhere from zero to 60 parts per million calcium and magnesium. And then hard is anything above that with very hard being above 180 parts per million. Now this is a, um, groundwater contamination that is perfectly natural. Uh, it's also not something that's going to kill you, but it is more of one of these things that's inconveniencing. Uh, because what this does is it prevents soap from lathering properly. It prevents soap from bubbling up nicely, which means it prevents soap from cleaning things as well. And the other thing is hard water leaves scale. When you have really hard water, um, that's when you're going to start getting all that white stuff caking around your, um, your shower and, like I said, in your coffee pot or um, at, at your sink, at your faucet. That's uh, what you're going to get from hard water. So it's um, not fun to have, so we uh, want to try to take care of it, especially if we're in one of these areas where we have very hard water. We can see down here we have, um, let's see, here's Texas, and uh, we have soft water to moderately hard water here. In West Texas, they tend to have very hard water though. And a lot of that has to do with what the ground, uh, what the uh, bedrock is, because the, the groundwater flows through that bedrock. And if you have a lot of, for example, limestone bedrock, you tend to get, um, uh, you tend to get harder water in certain circumstances. So what do we do about this? Well, you might install a water softener. And a water softener uses zeolite minerals uh, that have what's known as cation exchange capacity. And this is just a special characteristic of these zeolite minerals. And what cation exchange capacity means is we start with a sodium zeolite. So this is a, this mineral that has sodium in its crystal structure. And when it gets exposed to a whole bunch of the magnesium in the um, hard water, the zeolite's like, I don't want the magnesium anymore, or I don't want the sodium anymore, I want magnesium instead. So it kicks out the sodium and takes in the magnesium in its crystal structure. Structure. Same thing with calcium. We have this sodium zeolite. A lot of water with calcium passes through it and it will take the um, calcium and give up the sodium. So it exchanges those ions, right? It exchanges calcium, um, takes the calcium, gives up the sodium. So you might be saying, well, isn't my water then getting salty if I do this? Well, there's, it's such a small amount you wouldn't notice the extra sodium in the water. You'll notice the extra calcium or magnesium, but the sodium, you wouldn't even notice it in there. And this is why if you have a water softener, you have to buy salt every now and then to recharge those zeolites. So what you have to do is you have to run some salty water through them because then they'll give up the calcium and magnesium and take up that sodium and they'll be ready to exchange those things once again. And so that's how water softeners work. They have these zeolites with that cation exchange capacity, so they're able to t easily take the calcium and magnesium out of the water. 
Now another problem that you can have with uh, uh, bodies of water is something called eutrophication. And this is the development of high nutrient levels in a body of water. And uh, this often happens because um, a lot of fertilizer is used to make crops or make lawns grow better and some of those nutrients then go into the surface water and what this then causes it causes algal blooms so you'll have a lake like this and look at all that green in there all that like uh, um, uh, algae growing in there it shouldn't really look like that there's more algae than should be growing in that lake but that's because we have all of these extra nutrients making the algae thrive well, what then happens, that algae is um, going to grow and thrive and we're going to have more algae than should be in that, um, in that pond. And uh, then eventually the algae is going to die and it's going to start to decay. And as it decays, we have aerobic decomposition going on. And so this algae organic matter gets broken down by microorganisms in that lake, but this uses oxygen, right? It uses O2. And because we have too much algae, more than what should be in that lake or pond, it can actually use up all of the oxygen in the water. You know what else needs oxygen in that water? Whatever fish are living in there, whatever little crustaceans and things. So this can kill a lot of the organisms that are living in there because the oxygen gets used up. And that's what we're looking at right here in this diagram. This thing right here, it says NPK. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are some of your common um, nutrients that are put into fertilizer. So we fertilize this area and the uh, excess of that fertilizer, if we use too much, ends up going into this pond. So this, um, we get this, uh, the increased nutrients make the algae bloom. Eventually they die. Increased decomposition uses up oxygen in the water, and then we get these fish kills. Now, after um, aerobic decomposition goes on and all of the oxygen is used up, you can have anaerobic decomposition, which occurs in the absence of oxygen. So we do still have some decomposition going on as the, when the oxygen is used up. It's a slower decomposition, and this produces uh, hydrogen sulfide and methane gases. And this is why swamps often smell funky. Those gases have some kind of funky smells to them. And um, in swamps, you tend to have anaerobic water. You have stagnant water with low oxygen. So you end up getting some of this decomposition going on. And so that's why you have those uh, funky smelling swamps. Now, this is showing coastal eutrophic conditions in, uh, in the U.S., and we can see in the red, those are places with more eutrophication. Um, and some of this is because, for instance, the Mississippi drains all kinds of farmland, and so we get a whole lot of uh, extra nutrients uh, down there causing that eutrophication. All right, so um, those were a couple of types of um, um, contaminants that we can find in water, but there are more. We also have metals, and many metals um, are not toxic at background levels. So what I'm trying to say is in typical groundwater, yes, you're going to have a little bit of copper, you're going to have a bit of iron, you're going to have a little bit of various metals. But at these very, very low levels that are normally found, um, it's not going to do anything to you. It's going to be perfectly fine. Now, metals, though, uh, every now and then they can occur at potentially harmful levels naturally. Uh, I know when I worked in New Mexico, um, there was an area where the groundwater was tested and it had high arsenic levels in it, higher than uh, what we would want to have in our groundwater. And so um, uh, the Bureau of Geology that I uh, worked for did a study to see uh, where this arsenic was coming from. 
and unfortunately where it was coming from was the bedrock. So it wasn't really, it wasn't any company, it wasn't any chemical plant, it wasn't any sort of industry causing this, it was simply the bedrock had high arsenic levels and so when you had this groundwater flowing through it, it would pick it up and the groundwater ended up having this higher arsenic. And so the conclusion was there's nothing we can do about that, it is no one's fault. It is, a, it is a natural source of contamination. But that being said, um, we do have a lot of um, sources of contamination that are um, not natural. And uh, we can have heavy metals get into our water supply. Now, examples of heavy metals include things like um, Metallica and um, ACDC. Oh, no, okay, sorry. Uh, examples of heavy metal include mercury, lead, and cadmium. Those are some common heavy metals. There are some other ones out there. And these are especially bad because heavy metals affect the central nervous system of, uh, of organisms. And the central nervous system includes things like your breathing and your heart rate and your motor control. So if you have heavy metal poisoning, um, you won't be able to uh, control like writing or things. You'll, you'll get um, shakes and eventually it can uh, kill you because it will uh, basically, you'll not be able to breathe anymore because your central nervous system doesn't send the right messages uh, to your lungs. Um, now these tend to accumulate in organisms higher in the food chain. And um, this is why, for instance, uh, oftentimes like swordfish will have more mercury in them than say some um, smaller uh, prey fish and that's mainly because um, the heavy metals stay around a long time in your body and so the more of the the more of it you eat the more of it will accumulate and stick around in your body so definitely want to stay away from heavy metals well, where do heavy metals come from? Often from uh, different kinds of industries, but I, um, I do want to point out that, um, you know, sometimes regulations can be a good thing. Um, so this is a miner in uh, Senegal, and he has some rock right here. This uh, rock has a little bit of gold in it. And what he's doing is to concentrate that little bit of gold that's in there, he's taking some of that rock, putting it in this like little burlap bag and pounding it into a powder. Then he's gonna take that, which is mercury, and no, I don't recommend holding it in your hand, although it is kind of fun because it's really heavy and you can like pour it and I've done that, don't recommend it. Um, but he's gonna take some of that mercury, pour it in the bag, kind of swish it around, and what that does, gold likes to hang out with mercury, so it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna take all that little bit of gold that's in there. And then he's going to, because mercury has a low vapor temperature, it's gonna basically burn off the mercury and be left with a little dot of gold in there. Well, all of that mercury is going off into the atmosphere, and uh, the next time it rains, some of it's gonna come down, and it's uh, going to, um, you know, enter the water system. And no, covering your nose like that is not preventing you from breathing mercury vapors. So not a good thing right there. Um, but in uh, the U.S. we do have um, mercury going into the atmosphere as well, not necessarily from little mining operations like that, but from other industrial processes, including generating electricity from, uh, say, coal-fired power plants. And so we see right here, I know this is a little bit of an older um, diagram, but it was one that was nice and colorful. And we see where we have the population centers and industrial centers. That's where we also tend to have the most um, atmospheric mercury deposition. Now, in addition to metals, there are other contaminants that can uh, pollute the, our waters. Um, chlorine, chlorine is an inorganic pollutant and it is used to treat wastewater. So when, uh, when you flush the toilet or you take a shower, all that water goes away to a wastewater treatment plant. And um, one of the last steps they'll do at the wastewater treatment plant is 
treat that water with a little bit of, of chlorine before discharging it back into the environment. And the, the one problem is if a little too much chlorine is put in, it can actually harm algae and um, fish populations. Now other inorganic pollutants can be things like acids. And this includes uh, especially acid mine drainage. And this acid mine drainage does not occur at every mining location. It occurs where sulfide minerals are extracted. Sulfide minerals are minerals where you have a metal bonded to sulfur. And when these minerals are exposed to the atmosphere and to water, they undergo a chemical reaction that results in creating acid. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in some of the upcoming lectures um, uh, when we talk about mining. But let me show you what this uh, acid mine drainage looks like. This is at Leadville. Notice the kind of funky colors of those rocks. Uh, that's not the color that they had when they were underground, but because these have a lot of these sulfide minerals, in the hundred or so years they've been exposed at the surface, they're undergoing this chemical reaction and making acid mine drainage. You can see the same thing here where water flows. We have this uh, weird color that's created because of that acidic water. And this is actually in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. You can see uh, this is a creek, and it's water flowing in that area, and definitely should not have that color, right? Um, but that's acid leaking out of uh, mines that were um, operating back in the late 1800s. And so we still have this acid mine drainage uh, today. And so that's some sources of pollution. And uh, we'll see a few more on how to clean things up in volume two.